Hey everyone, Gio here from Fandom United. Welcome back to the channel. I hope all of you are having a great work week so far. We are at the halfway point. Today is July 7th, and we have a wide range of topics to discuss. But we're going to start with the breaking news. This comes from Deadline, and they're saying Disney's Marvel Studios and Warner Brothers DC Films to skip San Diego Comic Con at home. According to the report, this will be the third year in a row that Warner Brothers has opted out. And the rumor that I'm hearing online is that Comic-Con is close to bankruptcy and are needing an influx of cash due to the pandemic. Now, there is some weight to this rumor when you consider that Comic-Con is trying their hardest to do an event in November. They infamously tried to do it around Thanksgiving. Uh, last I heard, that is not happening but they really want to do an event in November. Let's see if that happens. But we all could have seen this coming a mile away. DC Phantom was a huge success last year. I had so much fun. I can't wait to cover it on this channel. Subscribe so you don't miss it. But then Marvel did their Investors Day meeting where they not only announced theatrical films, but projects for Disney Plus, And they gave us a preview of some other things as well. It was a fun virtual event for both Marvel and DC fans, comic book fans in general. In my opinion, it works out great for both of them. It's a lot more convenient. You don't have to wait hours in line for a Hall H panel. And honestly, it's good for both studios because instead of their projects, their upcoming films trending on Twitter for like an hour or two before the next Hall H panel, they get a full 24 hours because it's a virtual event dedicated for their stuff as opposed to sharing the spotlight with other studios. So we'll see what happens. I mean, it would suck to have San Diego Comic-Con go away entirely. I never made it to a Comic-Con in San Diego. I live in Sacramento. But you guys, let me know your thoughts on this matter. If you've been to a Comic-Con before, what was your experience like? If you got to watch DC Fandom last year or the Marvel Investor Day, what was your experience with that? I'm curious what you guys think. Let me know down below. But we're going to get started with our first topic. And this one is an extremely fun one for myself and for many of you out there. Director Quentin Tarantino was recently asked about his thoughts on Zack Snyder's Justice League, a.k.a. the Snyder Cut, and his reaction to fans rallying to get a director's original cut, an original version to be seen either on the big screen or in this case on a streaming service like HBO Max. Let's listen to what Quentin Tarantino had to say. And this is a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart, and I would love to get your take on it because it was a pretty big um, conversation that we had on the Ribbon podcast often. Is that you know, quite often you have you have total control over your films and and the cut that's going to get released. Um, but there was a filmmaker, Zack Snyder, who had a, a a movie called Justice League, and it took his fans three years to fight to get his version of it right. restored. Um, what were you thinking when you heard that whole thing going on about a, a studio keeping that that cut or, um, you know, preventing them from seeing it? And then the boon of streaming, you know, allowing something like that to even come out. I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that as it was going on. Well, I haven't I haven't seen it because I don't have HBO Max, but that's something I'd like I'll to give see. You my login. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something I would like to see. I never saw the other. I never saw when it was at the theaters, but I'd be kind of curious to see if like uh, his four hour, you know, uh, uh, his original a uh, uh, vision on that. Um, no, I actually thought that was really groovy, and I actually thought the fans were really groovy. That the fact that they kept they kept persisting on it and 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 everything. I think didn't he do something like that with also Watchmen as well? Yeah, there yeah. was a director's cut of Watchmen, yeah. but it wasn't like as fan driven as yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. This was yeah, no, this was like the fans demanded it yeah. kind of thing. No, I think that no, I think that's I think that's really groovy. I mean. I've made it a practice that my director's cut plays in three thousand cinemas on opening weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not everybody is you, Quentin Tarantino, clearly, okay? But, uh, I mean, that's nice. That That's that's really nice to hear. Does it mean anything as far as, like, our chances to restore the Snyderverse and have Zack Snyder do more DC on HBO Max? Does that get us any closer? No, but it's still nice to hear one of the top, top filmmakers in Hollywood uh, give some praise, admire uh, the fandom, and um, 
show interest in watching something like Zack Snyder's Justice League. I'm very curious what he'll think of that movie. I'm pretty sure he's going to love it. But um, if you've seen Zack Snyder's Justice League, let me know what you thought, okay? I mean, clearly, <laughs> y'all know how I felt about the movie. Um, but that's cool of Mr. Tarantino to do something like that. And um, just something I wanted to share in case you were a supporter out there of this movement, in case you thought you stuck through all the uh, trolling and all the um, you know hate online from, we don't need to get into it, but let me know your thoughts down below. And let's move on to another uh, DC topic, another feel good story. Uh, James Gunn was uh, commenting about his uh, relationship with Warner Brothers on Twitter. And he had this to say, when I first met with WB Pictures and DC Comics about the Suicide Squad, I said it would need to be an R-rated war film with no holds barred. I am always up front with partners about what I want to do. They agreed. Once the rules were set, we were off and running. I love this movie. And a certain someone quote tweeted that, and that was director David Ayer of the first movie who replied, dang. And the reason why David Ayer is replying that is because he would have liked the same treatment that James Gunn got when he was doing his uh, Suicide Squad movie. He would have wanted an R-rated version. If you remember... That first trailer of Suicide Squad that uh, leaked from Comic-Con, I believe 2015, it was heavily dark and heavily R-rated. But of course, the studio being who they are, wanted it to be more fun. They had a knee-jerk reaction to Batman v Superman, so on and so forth. So James Gunn replied to David Ayer and gave him credit. He said... Although a lot of the major players at Warner Brothers were different people, there was no doubt their troubles with you helped to pave an easier path for me, David. So I'm very grateful for that and for everything else you did to help this movie along its path. Now, James Gunn didn't quite go as far as supporting the release of David Ayer's original version of Suicide Squad, but still, that's just great to see, okay? Like... James Gunn realizes he was given a certain kind of leeway, a certain kind of creative freedom to do what he wanted and not David Ayer. And that's not on James Gunn. That's not James Gunn's fault. Look, I've said this before. I want to see David Ayer's original version of Suicide Squad. Would it all of a sudden make it a perfect movie for David Ayer to restore whatever he had to take out of his original cut? No. I mean, we haven't, we, I don't, I, we haven't seen the movie. How am I gonna, how the fuck am I supposed to know? But the fact that we could get more character backstory, we could get a better picture of Jared Leto's Joker, the full version, not the watered down crap that Warner Brothers gave us. And who knows? Who knows what the final product will be? But you know what? We were right about this one. And now we're calling for David Ayer's original version of Suicide Squad. And Nobody's saying release it next month because exactly a month from now, James Gunn's The Suicide Squad will release in theaters. You give that movie the rest of the year, sometime in 2022, you put the original version on HBO Max. Seriously. Is it going to take away from the first movie? Half of you don't even like the movie. So what? It's not going to interfere with, with uh, James Gunn's The Suicide Squad at all. Why not? It's more content for HBO Max. We get to see a better version of of likely Jared Leto's Joker and more character backstories. If you were so invested in the characters in the first movie, if you think that they were the best parts of the movie, then what's the problem with seeing more of them? That's just my opinion. I think I've, I've said this before. I'm on record. I think this happens in 2022. I think that's something that they cannot ignore. You know, with the discovery plus merger that's happening, the new blood in there, the new people coming on board, they're going to look at that and be like, why aren't we doing something? Anything. It doesn't cost $70 million to add, you know, David Ayer's original footage back into the movie and, you know, $5 million just to touch it up. I think it's a no brainer. I think Warner Brothers is 
once again, ignoring the fans, you know, and as far as James Gunn getting his um, amount of leeway, that's James Gunn making a name for himself over at Marvel. And now he has the name and the resume when he went over the D to Warner Brothers to say, hey, look, I did not one, but two successful uh, Marvel movies. Say what you will about Volume 2, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. It was still a success. And that likely made Warner Brothers think, you know what? You can't do no wrong. So we're going to give you all the resources. You probably can't kill Harley Quinn. And go do your thing. But you guys let me know your thoughts on this. And let's move on to the next topic here. We have some photos from the upcoming Army of the Dead prequel titled Army of Thieves. And here are four photos. From what we know about this movie so far, it is described as a romantic comedy heist film. And according to producer Deborah Snyder, the wife of Zack Snyder, she said this movie takes place in a world where... These zombies exist in America and it's causing instability in the banking institutions. They're moving money around, so it's a perfect opportunity for a heist. And Zack Snyder added, zombies will appear in the movie. And so these images right here tell me that a trailer is on the way. The movie apparently is releasing in 2021, probably around December. It's a much smaller movie than Army of the Dead. And a lot of people's character, fan favorite character, was Dieter. That's almost something I heard in every review, at least every review that I've you know read and listened to. I haven't seen everybody's review. But, hey, I'm invested into this world, okay? I am. I loved the characters. I thought the whole mythology was interesting especially when you consider the uh, theories that are going around, like uh, whether aliens are involved, the cyborg uh, zombies, Um, Zeus, his backstory. You know, when we first see him in the movie, he has all these uh, plugs on him and dog tags. Was he a failed experiment? We'll learn more about that in the animated prequel, Army of the Dead, Las Vegas. This one right here seems to focus on the Dieter character. So we can learn maybe how he ended up in Las Vegas from Germany all the way to Las Vegas. I'm curious, Uh, but I'm going to watch it. It's on Netflix. I'm sure it maybe will have a limited theatrical release and uh, it should be a fun watch if anything. So you guys let me know your thoughts on these photos for Army of Thieves and um I'm looking forward to that trailer like the rest of you. Let's move on to the MCU. I want to show you this pop figure and the significance behind it. So here you're looking at a pop figure of Killmonger. And he is holding a head of an Ultron bot. Maybe Ultron, but I'm pretty sure it's an Ultron bot. And this version of Killmonger in the Marvel Studios What If series will be the King of Wakanda. So how's that for a twist? Also, the cast will be led by Jeffrey Wright as the omniscient watcher and will feature a number of actors and actresses from the MCU live action movies, such as Haley Atwell, Josh Brolin, Michael Douglas, Taika Waititi, Karen Gillian, Jeff Goldblum, Samuel L. Jackson, Chris Hemsworth, Tom Hiddleston, Michael B. Jordan, and the late Chadwick Boseman in his final role as T'Challa. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, because one of the theories I've had for the longest time about the Killmonger character is him coming from another universe where his Wakandan kingdom is destroyed and he has no home. So he comes into the main MCU timeline, the sacred timeline, whatever it's called, and While he doesn't become the king of Wakanda, he could be a good guy version of Killmonger and be an important role in the MCU. Wakanda, that is missing its king, unfortunately, with the passing of Chadwick Boseman. Kevin Feige has said they're not going to recast the role and there's not going to be any sort of CGI fill-in for uh, Chadwick Boseman's T'Challa character. So... There could be a void on the throne. 
many people think it could it could go to Shiri, it could maybe go to Mbaku, but if I'm Marvel, considering the multiverse is happening, I mean I could easily put Killmonger back into the MCU, right? They did that for Gamora, but you could do something like that with Eric Killmonger, a character who, when he, whenever he was on the screen in Black Panther, he was a scene stealer. He was so incredible, and you just and I think it could easily be done. But that's just my thoughts. It's it's a theory right there. But I'm like, huh? I've had this uh, theory of mine for the longest time since before I even found out Killmonger was playing uh, the King of Wakanda in this What If series episode. And I'm like, man, that would be so cool to see Eric Killmonger, Michael B. Jordan back because he was so great. And Marvel's doing it anyway. They're bringing characters back to life, so why not? You guys, let me know if you have any theories or any uh, anything about Black Panther, any uh, any pitches at all. And finally, the last thing we're gonna do is uh, listen to Patty Jenkins. She was asked about uh, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, uh, the the movie that she is currently developing and will be shooting soon. And uh, she has some things she had to say about the process and. Uh, why she's doing this movie so let's listen and uh we'll uh, react so here we go i'm in love with all three projects on my plate right now i'm definitely doing rogue squadron next and i'm excited to do wonder woman 3 and so you know these are all and cleopatra is coming along great as well and so we'll see how it works out but um you know i may just never stop I may just make movies back to back if they would let me. I, I would love it. So I think the Michael Stackpole books and the and the video game and all of the Rogue Squadron books. I think they all have. A, there's a there's an incredible history that it's really important to honor, and um, and yet it must be brought to a new age because we have to tell a new story with it. And so you're kind of you're trying to blend the best of everything and make it the great fighter pilot movie, which I've always wanted to make as well. And so um, yeah, you're just it's a it's a, it's a big brew <laughs> of things that you're trying to put together and still keep a very simple story. You're trying to bring the best of yourself and use it to make something beautiful that honors the legacy before you. But of course, it's like, it's a huge amount of pressure of, uh, and Wonder Woman was a huge amount of pressure as well. So, you know, it's not, it's not a totally new feeling to me, but yeah, definitely uh, nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd be lying if I said uh, my excitement didn't take a hit after Wonder Woman 1984. Now, let me just remind those of you who haven't heard me talk about Wonder Woman 1984. I thought it was fine. I thought while heavily flawed, ultimately a feel-good movie and Gal Gadot as Diana Prince is the best that she's been in the DCEU so far. I mean, just think about that scene where she had to walk away from uh, Steve Trevor. And um, regardless of that, you know, decision that Patty Jenkins went for, um, Gal Gadot's acting was fantastic. And um, so I think Patty Jenkins still has everybody's vote of confidence is are they as confident as they were before wonder woman 1984 assuming you felt similar to how i did about the movie uh no but still you don't make that first wonder woman movie you don't direct charlie Theron to her oscar with the uh, monster and uh not be that that talented okay and not have at least some leeway okay wonder woman 1984 she stumbled, she fell, but she's going to get back up. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens with Rogue Squadron. I love that she is somebody who is tying her past and talks about her father and how her father was a pilot and bringing that love, that uh, passion, that sentimental, you know, emotion into a movie like this. And uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see. But that's going to do it, guys. That's going to do it for Fandom United, our daily news recap for July 7th. You guys let me know your thoughts on all the uh, topics that I have discussed. Uh, thank you again for your time and for your subscriptions. If you're new, I would appreciate a thumbs up. 
and do subscribe. I do videos on news Monday through Friday. Um, as long as there's enough topics and enough topics that interest me, um, I do my Sunday live streams, uh, Phantom United Live, every Sunday at 7.30 Pacific time. This Sunday, I'll be talking to Richard Donner with a friend of mine. We're going to go through his entire film slate. We're going to talk about some fun stories that I'm going to be uh, researching online, some clips from interviews, etc. So join me for that. And thank you guys so much again. I hope all of you have a great rest of your day. Until tomorrow, you guys take care.